Thank you all very much for coming. And I'm sorry some of you have to sit on the stand. But, um, but I'm really intrigued by this space that we're in because, because there are little dramas happening everywhere all the time. <laughs> Three different kinds of public space. Connecting space, ceremonial space, and in-between space. I'm not sure what that one is. Uh, it, was, it was very nice to see the young people sitting under the parasol. There's no sun, there's no rain at the moment, but the parasol is the most comfortable place to sit, and comfort is the most important thing in public space. So, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to speak in English. I have to speak in English. Um, I, uh, I, I also have to signal when we need a slide changed, because um, I have no clicker. So, first slide, please. I want to start by, by explaining, and, and I have a little apology for any of you who happen to have heard my me talk before. I, I very often tend to use the same material. Um, this is because um, uh, because public space is so complicated that unless you have had personal experience of a particular project, very often you don't know the complexity. And so uh, I feel more confident talking about um, things which, of which I have personal experience. Because if you don't have the personal experience, you never know how much of the story you've been told. And it's useful to remember that always with different kinds of um, uh, public art. So, um, can you go back one slide, please? This is a street in Liverpool. Um, my children grew up, they were born in Liverpool, grew up in Liverpool. They walked to school down the streets like this sometimes. Uh, this, is, this is what I was working in Liverpool for 25 years to stop. I think if a child walks down the street like this, it's damaging to their psyche, damaging to their mentality. Um, the environment around us is made by us. We are responsible for this. And you may not feel personally responsible, but, but, but children understand that their, their world is made by adults. And so they see this and they think, why would an adult make this? Um, so there's a lot wrong with our urban environment. And this is um, this is Hong Kong. Some of you may have been to Hong Kong, recognise the kind of housing that there is in Hong Kong. These, these are old houses now, um, from I think from the 80s. But next one, please. This is quite new housing from Hong Kong, and it's not much better. Um, these, this kind of environment is, has an effect on the way we think. This is in Chongqing. Chongqing is a city of 30 million people. 30 million. A lot of people have never heard of Chongqing, but it's a very big city. Um, <clears throat> uh, and these, as you can see, these towers are being built now. So this is, this is, the, this is the progress of humanity towards the present. This is where we have reached. Try, try to imagine how proud the citizens will be of this city when it is built. Um, next one, please. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So, um, my, my own interest in public space and um, how to um, how to uh, approach public space is built on um, the experience of my children in Liverpool and my own experience in visiting um, Asia and just seeing with my own eyes and feeling the, the environment that is being made. <coughs> this is not a new problem. That's to say, the idea of valuing place 
as an aesthetic experience, and I think the word aesthetic is very important, is very, very old. So we know this from classical literature in Europe. The Romans and, uh, talked about genius loci, uh, the spirit of the place. And the spirit of the place was, uh, if you like, in the, was articulated by storytellers in the old days. Today, the genius loci of places in Europe is articulated by marketeers, marketing consultants. In the new world, they don't, they call it placemaking, straightforward, because they have chosen very often to erase history completely, and so they need to make places from the beginning, and very often it's left to the real estate developers to make the place. But they know this, this expression, placemaking, is, is, has a very long history now in uh, North America in particular. In Asia, people have, there is a very old skill and body of knowledge called Feng Shui, which is about, about place, it's about how things relate to each other in place. Uh, and this, uh, traditionally, is, um, this body of knowledge is held by shaman. Um, more recently, it, it has also been tapped into by developers. But I bring that in, and also in, in Australia, in, the Aboriginals have the, have the, um, uh, the technique of making song lines, which was, although they were nomadic people, they were very aware of, of place. Place was incredibly important, and they expressed place through song lines. <clears throat> of course, as part of the new world now, um, place making in Austra Australia is undertaken by developers. So, I just give that little, little kind of international or global outlook and historical outlook to remind us all that the sense, the sense of place is not something new, it's something fundamental in culture, um, which, which in many places around the world, Europe as well as Asia and the New World, we have been neglecting or doing very badly and damaging um, people and damaging community life as a result. So, what can artists do about this situation? Next slide. Why, you know, my background is in the history of art and in working with artists. I happen to have become interested in placemaking uh, and place remediation, but, um, but why, what, what is the fit there? Why should artists have anything to do with placemaking? Well, um, there is a, there is a, I, I think that the business of making art and the business of making place are analog, analog, analogous to each other. They are analogies because artworks are made from form. There is a, a design, an aesthetic object, and there is a story, a narrative to tell about that form. Or almost any artwork you can think of has some kind of physical presence, even if it's only typed on a page, and it also has a context or a story which the artist will tell about it, or which critics make up about it, or whatever. But there is always a narrative dimension to an artwork. This is no different from places. Places are physical, material entities um, which have been designed um, intentionally or unintentionally. So they have an aesthetic, which is good or bad. Uh, but places also have a history. They also um, gather to themselves the memory of what has happened there. People tell stories about what has happened there. Um, uh, and they also express geography. I mean, fundamentally, they express geography. So if you accept that these processes are analogous, that artists, that the way that, 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 that an artwork is constructed and the way that a place is constructed are the same kind of process, then it makes 
then it's obvious why artists can also contribute to placemaking. They have skills to bring form and narrative together. Next one, please. So, um, in, in Liverpool, and in, uh, when I was doing Liverpool Biennial, and in Folkestone, now that I'm doing Folkestone Triennial, I, I want to bring artists to those urban environments to express the place, to articulate the sense of place. The artists I want to bring to those places very often know nothing about the place because they are from somewhere else. And this is a, this is a strategy which well, I can talk about later, but maybe not now. It interests me to bring somebody from outside a culture into a culture and see how they react with each other. But this means that the artist who comes into the situation starts by knowing nothing. They have an information deficit. And I think that it's my job as curator to make up that deficit, to help them understand what the place is. Uh, and that means understanding its geology, understanding its history, understanding its geography, um, and understanding as much as possible about its urbanism, the infrastructure, the built environment, everything about it. To help me um, uh, explain this to artists, I, um, I have commissioned an urban analysis. Could you please find me urban analysis? Um, an urban analysis, that those of you who are architects or planners know what an urban analysis is, but others of you may not know. An urban analysis is very often used by a developer in order to create a logic for the development that they are about to undertake. So it is effectively, um, uh, it's an analysis of the history and geography of a particular site. <clears throat> uh, and on an urban planning level, on a, on a macro level, uh, it, it will be um, an analysis of the geology and geography and history of a whole town, a whole city that enables master planning to take place. Uh, the planning office of a, of a municipal government will very often have some kind of urban analysis to refer to uh, in order to check the appropriateness of a particular proposed kind of development or to, or to master plan the entire situation. So I, I give this information to artists who are coming to um, Folkestone now so that they can uh, understand why the environment, the urban environment, looks the way that it does and also understand some of the problems. For instance, it's a very quick example, but it's a very important one. In Folkestone, we have a one-way system for traffic, which was designed in the 1960s, when there was a roll-on, roll-off ferry. This is, a, this is a ferry terminal, it was a ferry terminal. So we had a, a lot of uh, big lorries coming through Folkestone and it needed, the streets are quite narrow, they needed to be one-way system in order to allow the traffic coming off the ferry to get away from Folkestone as quickly as possible. The ferry closed 20 years ago, there is no ferry. So there is no traffic of the same kind. The one-way system is the same, it hasn't changed. So this one-way system is a piece of infrastructure that is like a dead weight holding down the, the, uh, the urban environment, preventing change because, uh, because the town council refuses to change its mentality and think that we might remake the infrastructure to be appropriate for the present or the future. It's a small example, but, but you can find examples like this in every urban situation, and, uh, and it's an urban analysis that helps one understand when those things happen and why they need to be put right. Next, can we go back to the um, main outline? Thanks.
So, actually, can, we, can you go on to the next slide? If you, yes, that's, that's great. And the next one, thank you. So, <clears throat> first, how do I work with artists to make places? I invite artists to post them, I give them a copy of the Urban Analysis, but, but also I ask them to listen, and I listen myself, to what uh, the preoccupations of people are. And, and it's very easy to do this. You sit in a cafe or you sit, uh, you sit in the street and listen to people's conversations as they go by. Um, uh, it's as easy as that. I mean, you can also call people together or, or whatever, but, but actually people talk all the time. And if you listen to what they're saying, then you, then you get some notion of what their preoccupations are. So, and, and people tell stories about, about their place. <coughs> And uh, what those stories are matters, and also the stories that people don't tell matter. Uh, so, for instance, um, uh, people talk a lot about um, the railways in, in Folkestone, because the railways were very important in this history. But, um, but nobody wants, uh, very few people talk about the fact we have military barracks in the town still. So there are, there are things which people are happy to talk about and things which people don't talk about. And it's important to listen to both of those things. Next, next slide. So then it, it's, it's, it's my job to, um, to put together the, the, um, the, the physical uh, and the conceptual uh, problems, uh, I mean, I hesitate to call them problems, they're, they're characteristics, if you like, the, the, the physical and the, and the conceptual characteristics of the town, I'm talking about focusing right now, and to find the right artist for that nexus of concerns. Who is the right artist? Well, um, uh, most artists have a consistent practice, let's just say. They, they, are, they have a main concern which goes all the way through their work. They make variations on that. But, but effectively, most artists are happy to continue to have the same message all their lives. It can, if it's a good message, then it's infinitely repeatable in infinitely different number of situations. Um, I think it's important to ask an artist who already... So if there is an artist whose concern is sustainable energy, then I would invite an artist who already had that concern to address a particular moment in Folkestone's um, urbanism for which sustainable energy was an important concern. So I think that's the job of the curator, is to find the right artist, the artist who wants to do that work in any case to match with that situation. <coughs> working outdoors, working in the street, working in public space is extremely hard. It's very, very difficult. Many artists cannot do it. Um, it demands a completely different way of looking at the world from working in a studio or working for a gallery. Within the gallery space, your art will always be seen as a part of the story of art, art contributing to the context of art, because when you walk through the door of the art gallery, you are entering the space of art. And that's, and that's great. Art is wonderful and it's, and it's terrific to add to it all the time. Um, public space is a completely different context. Many people will not enter a gallery because they don't feel they know anything about the history of art and they have no interest in art, so why should they go into a gallery? But everybody uses the street, everybody uses public squares. <coughs> uh, people bring a different context to the street and the public squares and the context that they bring is always a part of the kind of thing that is described in the urban analysis. Next one, please. 
So um, that's all of that was by way of introduction as to why I'm interested in public space, why I think art can do something about it, uh, how I invite artists to address particular issues within the urban um, environment. Now I have some case studies to show you. Um, uh, three, brought, three from Liverpool when I was working in Liverpool and three from Folkestone. And I'm going to try and finish in time to give us plenty of time for questions and discussion afterwards. Um, uh, Kirkdale is an area within Liverpool. It's a small, it's a small borough within the larger city of Liverpool. And it's an area with um, many, many problems. Um, a lot of unemployment, a lot of deprivation, um, uh, low educational um, attainment. Um, Rotunda Pavilion is, is, sorry, the Rotunda is a um, community college. So it's, it's an education facility for, um, for grown-ups, for, 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 for people who maybe didn't go to school, or maybe had low education attainment in school, or maybe simply want to continue their education. In England, we call it continuing education. So, uh, next, next slide, please. Um, this, um, this building, the tall building, the terrace of buildings on the right hand side, is the, is the space in which the um, Rotunda Community College um, uh, exists. It actually takes only two, the big. They're big houses, and um, it, uh, it takes two of those houses. Um, <clears throat> but it, um, it looks out on a, um, what you might call a square. It's a piece of open, open land, which is open only because the houses in it have been knocked down. So it's, it's um, an area in which most of the housing has been demolished, um, and this uh, terrace was kept only because I think it was listed. It was, it was, it was. They were, the council was not able to knock it down because it was listed as being important architectural character for the, for the area. You can see behind there is a big warehouse uh, which is empty. Um, there's actually a, a main street which runs. Oh, it's that grey car is where a, 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 a main street runs by, which connects. Um, the central Liverpool with uh, other further um, outlying northern boroughs. So Kirkdale, um, even, even some people who live in Liverpool have never heard of Kirkdale. It's not a famous place. And so the, the people who run Rotunda Community College um, came to me at the biennial and they said we, would, we, we need to, um, uh, we need some recognition for what we're doing. We're working all the time to educate our, our citizens, but nobody knows we exist. There is this road that passes by the end of our street, and um, nobody knows that we're here. We want to wave a banner and shout, here we are. So this is something that art is good for. You know, there's many, many things that art is no good for at all. But making a noise, waving a banner, is one thing that art is very good at doing. So I said, you come to the right person. Um, uh, let's see what we can do. And we were fortunate in that this was um, a couple of years before um, Liverpool was the European capital of culture. So we were able to um, get, our, get our hands on some money coming from European Capital Culture. And we employed um, uh, an architectural firm called Gross Max. It's from Edinburgh, you probably know. Um, uh, and um, I should explain before we go on to the next slide that this, this, this area looks reasonably nice in this photograph um, with wildflowers and so on. But when we, when we started, 
it was um, full of old mattresses and burnt out cars and you know, uh, sofas and all, all the kind of rubbish that people leave in open spaces. Next, please. So Grace Max um, designed and built this, um, this rusty pavilion, um, which, uh, which came out of quite a long process of discussion between them and the uh, users, the, the people who are taking courses at um, the community college. Uh, it was designed to be to be to support greenery. Basically, it was meant to it was meant to have green um, uh, uh, ivy and other uh, climbing plants, um, and you can you can see that it succeeded in doing that. This was because a, a, the one thing that um, everybody agreed on in the community college was that it would be nice to grow more things in the. Uh, in the open space in front of the building. So we started by clearing all the uh, old cars and mattresses from the, uh, from the open space and then um, reseeding it with um, grass and with wildflowers. At one end of the square, um, we uh, invited people to start allotments. So, so, so people took uh, allotments and you know, people, people dig their own gardens. Um, and the pavilion, this pavilion directly in front of the uh, community college, um, was a kind of celebratory moment. Um, it was the it was the man way. You can see it from the main, you can see it from the main road. In fact, you can see it from quite a quite a many, quite a lot of high places around. So the community next one, please. Um, community College was very happy with, um, with that addition to their um, outlook. So this is, a, this is a, a very different project. It's right in the centre of Liverpool. In fact, in some ways, it's, it's well, not in the centre from the point of view of the docks, but, but it's on a, two major axes. It's on the north-south axis, um, which, uh, which takes people through the town from north to south, and it's also on um, an east-west axis between the university and the shopping area. So many, many students, that's one place. Many, many students um, walk down this hill on the right-hand side, cross over the crossing, and you can see the cars are on the um, north-south axis. Students walk up and down the east-west axis. Um, the area behind the hoardings there, uh, in the top picture, uh, is, a, is a bomb site. It's, it was bombed in the, second, in the Second World War and it's remained empty ever since. Uh, which is very curious for such an important site. Uh, one reason it's empty is because um, at, one, at one point in the 1960s there was a plan to build a road which, which would start at that point. And because this because there remains some uncertainty from the planning process as to whether a road might still go through there or not, and no developer has ever been very keen to develop it. But the result is that there is a really important axial moment in, in Liverpool's landscape which lacks a landmark building of any description. So, um, we asked Atelier Bauer, which is a, 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 a architect's firm based in Tokyo, to have a look at this situation. Um, and they, um, next one please. They came up with this, that, 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 that fundamental understanding was that this was a theatrical moment. I mean, it's a dramatic moment in the landscape. <coughs> and so they, um, they took this to its literal, ex they extended this in a very literal way and said, okay, it's a, it's a theatrical moment, let's build a theatre. Let's build a, um, a Greek theatre, an auditorium, um, uh, looking down onto the street to, to create street theatre, effectively. I mean, I mean by t to turn the street into a theatre. 
Um, they weren't able to build it quite like that. Next slide, please. But they did build it like this, in wood. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and again. And, uh, uh, and we were able to open the space to um, to basically to anyone who wanted to perform in it. So we had poets who came to read their poetry, small bands who came to play their music, um, stand-up comedians practicing their comedy, um, or whatever. This was all entirely informal, no, nobody organized it. I mean, they, 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 we, we asked them to make a booking, just, just so that we didn't have three people turn up at once, but nobody was Nobody was saying no to anybody, so... Um, but even, even if there was nobody um, animating the space, uh, those, the doors at the bottom could open more widely. So every day, between hours of daylight, um, the gates would be open and people could simply watch other people going by. And, of course, um, the street is a theatre if you choose to look at it that way. Next one. Um, sadly, uh, we were unable to work with the city council, the local government. They didn't want this to continue. It's too anarchic for them. You know, in, ma in many countries, there is a law against association. You're not allowed to meet other people on the street. Um, that's that's, that's an important, um, it's an important um, discipline on publicness. What it means to have public space. If you can't, if you can't meet other people on the street, or it's limited. To, I think in China it's limited to six people. If there's more than six people on the street talking to each other. You're dispersed by the police. No. In this room, there is none. Thank you. I hope you will know that. <laughs> okay, next one, please. Uh, so this is this is a very different um, project. Um, uh, Sefton is a, is another borough to the north of uh, Liverpool. It's um, uh, there is a beautiful beach there at the mouth of the Mersey River. Um, uh, the Mersey River used to be a very, very dirty river, uh, and so nobody would use the beach because they, they believed it was toxic. I'm sure it was toxic. But um, during the 1990s, um, the river was cleaned. I mean, the river now that has fish and other life in it, and it's much, much better. And as a result, the beach is actually quite a nice place to go. But nobody went there because this is Crosby Beach with, um, with Crosby um, alongside it, the village of Crosby. Um, nobody used this beach um, because in people's minds it was still somewhere not, you, you shouldn't go. Um, the, the Government Development Agency approached me and the biennial uh, with um, with 60,000 pounds and said they, want, they wanted a huge and important artwork to attract people to, <laughs> to Crosby Beach. Uh, because once art had attracted the people to the beach, then of course they would realise that it was a great place to be and, um, and then they would keep coming to change people's habits. So, um, uh, with, with the £60,000, I borrowed a sculpture from Anthony Gormley and installed it, and it's a hundred um, uh, cast iron figures. Um, and uh, I, I borrowed them initially for 18 months, a year and a half. Um, but after the year and a half, um, then there was a discussion as to whether the artwork should stay or not. Um, and, and eventually the artwork stayed and it was paid for by the government um, and it has been very successful in um, 
bringing more people to Crosby uh, and uh, Crosby, the, the economic life of Crosby has improved, at least certainly the people selling hamburgers and, um, and ice creams on the, on the beach front has improved. Uh, I forgot to say that one of the, the government had already invested in a sea sports centre, some buildings with canoes and uh, you know, things for sea sports, but nobody would use it. So they were, they were very upset that they'd made this uh, investment, but it wasn't being used. And now I'm happy to say that a lot of people are using it. This artwork was extremely controversial. Um, uh, when it went to planning permission, it was refused planning permission at one point, and then, then we went a second time and it was agreed. But on the second time, um, uh, I had to have a police escort to get me out of the, it was, it was such violence and um, uh, uh, screaming and shouting. Um, <clears throat> so it, it's very controversial, but, um, but it's still there. Next one, please. Oh, just, just some more good photos. So now, now I'm moving location to, um, to Folkestone. Uh, with three, three examples from Folkestone. This, um, next one please. This one um, is, uh, a, 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 there is a steep piece of waste ground. This, the, the trees that you can see in the bushes, yes, this, this shows the state of this steep area of waste ground uh, with um, some very old pathways running through it. Um, uh, and around this area of waste ground, there are some key buildings, some important buildings. The one in the background here is a sixth form academy, so it's uh, school children, teenage school children. Um, uh, also, there is a theatre, uh, there are businesses around, there is an old people's home, uh, there is a youth hub, where um, a kind of youth club for um, young people. Um, and, the, and also what isn't evident is that the street that runs along the bottom of this area is um, private landlords uh, who attract migrants uh, and put too many people in too small a space. So, um, so, the, um, so there are people who don't speak uh, English, who are on the street at all times of day and night because there's too many people living in the houses which um, where, where, they're, uh, where they're housed. And so, for instance, the students are afraid of the immigrants, and um, the people who, who park their cars to go to the theatre are afraid of the immigrants. The old people hate the young people in the youth hub because the young people are noisy and the old people want quiet. Um, the business people want nobody to park. They hate the theatre because uh, because people come to the theatre and park where their customers should be parking. And everybody hates everybody. It's normal. Um, uh, and particularly the issue of car parking is, of course, the most the most toxic uh, issue. So we invited an architect, art and architecture firm called Muff from London to. To come and help us um, uh, bring down the temperature of, of between these different um, groups, to try to get them to talk to each other uh, and to use the space um, as a uh, as a communal space. We wanted to create effectively if if, if it's, the way the space was being used because it was waste in very commas because it was because it seemed to be unused. It's therefore anybody can say, okay, so it's my space. So I will play my music as loud as I like, I don't care what anyone else thinks. I will sell my drugs at night. I will take people to have sex in the park. Whatever it is, it's, it's, if, 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 if it isn't public space, then it's private, and you can do what you like with it, because it's private. Um, <clears throat> so we needed to create a sense of publicness, to create a sense of share, sharing that space. Once, once you recognize that you share the space, then you can no longer do just whatever you like. You have to respect other people. 
So the way that Muff approached this was, this, what you can see here is some pizza ovens. They made some pizza ovens and they invited the different groups around to come and make their own kinds of pizzas and, and share their pizzas with other people. And so there's some, uh, some cultural um, uh, learning through f food and cooking. Um, this is a, um, a silent disco. So there are um, there's some older people listening to jazz or, or to classical music and uh, dancing waltzes, and then there are young people doing um, doing whatever young people do <laughs> these days. I'm sure I can't do it. Um, so there's um, different kinds of dancing, different kinds of music uh, through the silent disco, and quite a lot of fun was being had. Next one, please. Oh, there was also, I don't know whether there was a picture, but they also did some archaeology. They invited me to, to make a dig underneath this waste ground to see what we could find. Um, uh, and actually, in the past, it had been used as a rubbish dump, so they found a lot of rubbish, which wasn't very interesting. But, but it, uh, it's a way to, uh, to, to establish what the history and the geology of the place were. So this was an early an early diagram about what um, Muff hoped to do with the space, just kind of um, uh, uh, um, a drawing about the history and the outlook. Uh, uh, and next one, please. Oh. Uh, keep going. Mm -hmm. Yes. So then, <laughs> this is this is a photograph of the finished design. Of course. Um, it wasn't, when the photograph was taken, it wasn't, um, it hadn't grown, so it was still, it still needed to mature, but all the hard landscaping was in. And um, the, the key idea that Muff continued with was that um, the, uh, the hard landscaping should be open in, uh, in its, you know, des designers of, um, of Park, equipment for parks or equipment for children's playgrounds or the, design, the people who design and sell the um, hardware for these activities. They make, they make objects that are very specialized to, with, a, with a defined use. And there's a, a commercial reason for doing that, obviously, because if you buy something which is only about little steps, then it doesn't allow you to slide down. You'd have to also to, to buy the slide, and you have also to buy the, 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 the bars to swing on, and you also have to buy the swings, and you also, so everything is defined, and so you have to buy as much of it as possible. It makes good commercial sense. But what, so what Muff were trying to do was to, was to make, to provide equipment that was um, multi, as multi, it could be used for as many different purposes as possible. So people could choose what they wanted to use it for. And their act of choice is an act of laying claim to the space through their cultural tradition, if you like. But then they would see somebody else doing something completely different with the same thing, and they would have to recognize and respect that other people think in a different way. So there are different behaviors, public spaces where you can behave differently, provided you respect what other people are doing. Uh, so that's, that's a key idea. But they, they, they like to think that individuals, whether children or, or older, are responsible. I mean, that, or if they, or they, they also like to think that um, risk is important, because risk is how we learn. So children, if children are not allowed to take risks, then children don't learn. Now, all of this, of course, is terribly bad news for the local government. <laughs> because the local government um, had to take on responsibility for this new park once it was made. And the park design did not fulfill health and safety regulations. It did not fulfill um, building construction regulations. It's not a building, so why should it? Um, but, but the refusal to meet health and safety regulations in an explicit way is a, was a very, very big problem for the council. So now, three years, four years later, we are still fighting the council every day. We want to close parts of the park in case a child falls over and hurts, hurts its knee or whatever. 
this would be a problem for the council, in the council's mind. So the life, the life of the park, the new park, is not only every day in terms of people interacting and getting different, um, using the park for different purposes, but it's also renewed every day in the conversation between the Creative Foundation who commissioned the park and the, and the local government who maintains the park. So this is, just, this is a photograph of the front, this is the opening of the park. Keep more, please, more. So, and again, more, more. Okay, so this is a, this is a different project, a new project. Um, next slide, please. Uh, it is a, um, a form of gas works. <coughs> um, a, there was a, this is a very built-up area of Folkestone. In fact, one of the earliest parts of Folkestone to be, to be built up. Um, it's in the river valley. You see this viaduct is where the railway goes over the valley. Um, and this site uh, was occupied by um, uh, quite expensive um, houses in the 1860s. <clears throat> but if the houses were built on land that was owned by a major landowner and during the 1860s he took back the land, knocked down the expensive houses and built gas works in order to provide gas for lighting for the other end of the town where he was busy developing a new town. So a very, a very um, clear example of um, social engineering um, by a landowner um, uh, deciding that one part of the town should be industrial and another part of the town, even though it had natural advantages, and another part of the town was going to be um, uh, residential, high-end residential. <coughs> okay, so this, this gas works was uh, stopped functioning in 1960 and has been an empty site since 1960, so that's uh, almost 60 years now. And it's surrounded by housing stock, which is actually very good. I mean, housing stock, if it was in London or Oxford or somewhere, would be worth millions of pounds. But, um, but because it is next to this empty site, a site that has been empty for 60 years, uh, this pulls down the value of the, of the, uh, of the houses. And the, um, and the local government is unwilling to consider the future of this site because it is still to some extent toxic I mean, there's still, there is still some toxicity in the soil from the gas works. Next one. Um, we wanted to draw attention, the Creative Foundation, the Triennial, wanted to draw attention to this gas works site because we feel that it's unfair that the people who live here should continue to live with this um, empty site. So we wanted to, again to use art to wave a banner. So um, come and look at this. Um, and uh, I invited an artist called Jill Bradley to come and um, have a look at it because she's a horticulturalist. She's, she's very interested in plants and what plants can do. Uh, and I, I was hoping that she could find some plants that would take the toxicity out of the soil. <coughs> um, but, uh, but the landowner, which is actually the gas board, um, uh, was unwilling to allow us to do any investigation. So she wasn't able to determine what was wrong with it, and, and so she was unable to find any um, uh, plants that might put it right. But while she was thinking about it, <coughs> she came up with this alternative, a different proposal, which was to, um, to plant um, hops, you know, hops are the, the vines that you put in beer, hops. Kent, well, around Folkestone is an area where hops, many hops are grown. And uh, she wanted to put uh, a hop field uh, and in, 
the circle, the, the hop field is square. And can we just go back one? The hop field is the square, and there is a circle inside the square, and the circle is where a, one of the gas storage, the gasometers, used to be. So she's taken the footprint of the gasometer, and she's put these, um, these green uh, poles, which are aluminium poles, green poles, and then uh, there is also a grid of uh, dark wooden poles, which are hop uh, poles you can grow hops up. Now, originally she wanted to grow hops up the plants, but we couldn't do that. Um, but, the, but the symbolism of this work, in her view, is that um, the, uh, the, the energy of the, um, of the gas works is, is um, expressed through the green poles and the, uh, and the hope of greening the site is expressed through the hops. Um, oh, great. Right. There, there are some more stories attached to that one, but we'll keep going. Next one, please. Next one, thank you. Next one, thank you. Okay, so this is the last example. <coughs> um, and, and the next one, please. So Michael Sellersdorfer, um, a Berlin-based artist, um, uh, the please go back one. So the um, you can see kind of three areas of sea. And this, the, the, the close area here is called the is the inner harbour. Then beyond the railway track, there is the outer harbour. And beyond that, there is a, um, a sandy beach, which is the main kind of leisure beach in Folkestone. <coughs> um, because of the foreshortening in the, in, the, in the photograph, it looks as if the leisure beach is quite small. In fact, it's, it's very big, and, and the inner harbour is very small, so it's the reverse of what you can see. But, um, but the importance of showing you this slide is that the outer harbour has always been considered an industrial an industrial harbour. I mean it's where the coal ships used to come into Anglo Coal, it's where a fishing fleet you, you would go from. It's uh, so it's it's an industrial area. And the leisure activity always took place, has always taken place on the sandy beach beyond. Uh, families with uh, children and buckets and spades, sand castles, all the rest of it, that all takes place in the the furthest beach. But as I said earlier, 20 years ago, the ferry stopped running. There hasn't been any coal ships coming into Folkestone for generations. Actually, the harbour is no longer an industrial harbour. It's, uh, it's, uh, there is no reason why people shouldn't use the harbour that is nearest the town, or sorry, the beach that is nearest the town for leisure activity. Next one, please. What Michael Salesdorfer did was um, bury uh, pieces of gold in the beach. He buried 30 pieces of gold, very small pieces of gold, but worth maybe two, two or three hundred euros. He buried 30, 30 of these pieces of gold on the beach <coughs> and, uh, and then advertised it in the press. Um, so his, his idea was to get, um, to make a public artwork, as I said, to get the public to make his artwork for him by digging. So the, the digging activity is the artwork, which is erased every day by the tide, uh, and so people can start again the next day. Um, you can see people with metal detectors, and this, <laughs> Uh, we thought of that one, so we put lots of metal washers in the beach. As well. uh, so, so they kept finding iron washers rather than gold. Uh, <laughs> and you can see that the one result of this artwork was to clean the beach. All of this, all of this um, metal work came out of the beach, making it safer for children to play. So it's a kind of self-cleaning mechanism for the beach. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, the next one. Um, you can, you, I mean, this, this was well, only a few days after the gold was buried, so there was still a great deal of activity. But, but actually, the, uh, the activity still continues now. So what has happened is that people's behaviour has changed. People's understanding of Folkestone's leisure amenities has changed. Uh, they thought before that the only place they could make sandcastles was on the main sand beach. Now they understand they can also make sandcastles nearer, nearer to where they live. Um, this is consistent with Folkestone, the need for Folkestone to change its identity from being an industrial place. It, it will never be a ferry port again, that's finished. It will never have trains coming to the, to the seafront again, that's finished. It needs a new identity, and the new identity is going to have to be about leisure and creativity. And so, <clears throat> these people are enacting, they are embodying uh, the direction that the town is taking. Through their behaviour, they are showing that Folkestone can leave behind its industrial past and embrace a, a new kind of identity in the future. Next one, please. And again. Um, so the, for, for a short moment, this artwork was extremely famous or in England and, and even in China, actually. It really caught a lot of imagination. Next one, please. Um, so this is, this is just a map to contextualize <coughs> how the triennial works. Uh, basically, the the, the green triangles are new artworks commissioned for 2017 uh, this year. The, all the um, blue spots are artworks which have been left behind from previous triangles. The idea with, with the triangle is to create a town collection, a collection of artworks in public space around the town, which you can see any day of the week, 24 hours a day. Uh, and so about half of the triangles will become blue spots after the end of this triangle. Uh, next one, please. So just to recapitulate, um, how, how do artworks make places? How do artists help to create places? Artworks and places are constructed from forms and narratives and conversations. It's the conversations that people have about the artwork that helps well, that, that does create a sense of publicness or public um, public ownership of space, um, and I think that that business of having conversation, of, of public debate, is a part of being a civic society. It's about it's it, that's how um, the possibility of <coughs> citizens action by citizens. Um, can be created. If nobody's talking to anybody else, then uh, it's very unlikely that um, that citizens will take control of their own lives and take responsibility for what happens around them. Next one, please. Um, and um, I mean, particularly in light of these uh, issues about laws against assembly in public spaces. Um, you can see the, um, if you want to, you can view the placemaking movement all over the world as a part of a battle between um, um, people who want a civic society, which requires public space, and people who are prepared to be passive consumers of whatever is given them as individuals without, without, <coughs> without um, debate. Um, and I do believe that bad urban environments destroy social value and, and the next stage after that is to destroy citizens' capabilities, destroy citizens' ability to change their own environment. Next one. So that's, those are some websites which, um, which might interest you. Um, uh, Biennial Come Archive is Liverpool Biennials. Um, uh, back catalogue is a word. Folks and Triennial is the same for Folks and Triennial, and Institute of Public Art is 
um, is a collection of research about, uh, of case studies of um, public art from all around the world. This little image is one of my favorite images. I, I, I took a photograph in Japan. I was just wandering down the street and, uh, and I saw this gap between two buildings, or it's, 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 only, it's only a meter deep, or about a meter and a half deep. <clears throat> and you can see, what, what it, it's a place where, um, where the pavement comes between two buildings because the utilities are there. You know, this, is, this, is the, this is the water and the gas. But, so they had to be there, but the person, the people who live on both sides couldn't bear to leave it just like this because, because after all it's public space, so they had to make their own addition to it. Uh, these little, beautiful little stone, um, stone uh, supports and, um, and a plant. So this is about an individual deciding that public space is something which they can care for. Thank you very much for listening. So I hope, um, I hope maybe I have stirred up some comments or, or questions. We, uh, we have some time, is that right?
taken, has researched the stories of some of the people who were buried there and has turned that into a, a, a libretto and a, a choral work, basically, a five-part choral work. And there are five speakers dotted around the burial ground. And you, if you can find four friends to come with you, and you stand one, in, in, it's interactive. So you, you need four people to stand with you in front of the different speakers. And then you get your five part choral artwork. Um, and it's had a phenomenally popular reception. I mean, I, obviously, I hope that every artwork is going to have. <laughs> have a popular reception, but this one has been astonishingly popular. Yeah. I have a personal observation, a uh, comment, because you spoke about the opposition to the Anthony Gordon at another place, but what we didn't talk about, I think the question is, the huge public support at the end, by the end of the project, and actually people have been called forced to keep that and actively, and I think that was a huge part of it. And it's been so warmly adopted by people that have and every Christmas they all put Santa hats on and people go out and they're really taking that piece of their hearts. And I think a lot of people who would say they didn't like art found it very approaching, found that they were able to engage with that and, and it changed their opinion about how they interact with art. I think it's hugely successful on that level. And a supplementary question is, how important do you think it is that people see what you do as art? Or do you think actually sometimes it's better that they don't? No, that's a very good, a very good um, comment. Yes, I, 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 I do think that, um, in a sense, I mean, f from the point of view of making the artwork, we need someone who has a strong vision, because that's that's the um, that's the that's the value that the artist can bring. But but whether or not that is an artist from the point of view of the person who looks at the result doesn't matter at all, I don't think. If, if, as long as people can read what it is that they're being asked to, or invited to read. Um, no, I, I do think the category of art gets in the way. I mean, it's, it's, it's very elusive, it's a kind of shape shift, isn't it? Because sometimes um, people are ready to accept art when they're not ready to accept anything else, you know. I mean, if, <clears throat> this, this exhibition that I just made in Folkestone, when I was still planning it and uh, you know, doing some pre-publicity with the press, uh, people said, oh, so this is a political exhibition. And I was very uh, keen that they shouldn't see it as a political exhibition because uh, as soon as something becomes politics, that's a reason to reject it. Um, uh, whereas, if it's understood to be art, then then it doesn't matter anyway. <laughs> so, so everybody can accept it because it doesn't matter. Uh, I'll, I'll be, um, the can also be the negative, yes. I mean, it depends so much on the, on the circumstances. I mean, that's what's so wonderful about art, is that it, so, it sh shifts its shape depending on the context completely. And, um, yeah. yeah. Having to deal with an item to Victor Eliabello in terms of the city council saying no to the longer term ambition of the project, and, and also as a, like a subset to that, like, is art is always to make you happy? You know, is there some sense in which it shouldn't, it shouldn't often resolve problems that don't go away very easily, even when the work is great? So it's, and I think you mentioned twice uh, also with, uh, with most, you know, this resistance of the city council to, to, to allow a longer term development. Like, how, how does um, an artist or, um, operate? When, as, let's say, a council says, mm -hmm. this isn't. And it often has the power, but if the artist or the No, it's a, it's a very important question. I mean, uh, I think the Atelier Bauer. Um, 
there's a, there's a difference in philosophy between the Liverpool Biennial and the Folkestone Triennial. And the Folkestone Triennial, as I think I explained, the ambition of the funders is that is to create a collection of permanent artworks in the town. So treating the town <coughs> as a gallery or a museum. In, in Liverpool, um, the, the assumption is always that the work will not stay. It's about temp it's about it's a temporary exhibition. And um, and actually in many ways I think the temporary approach is more interesting. Um, so 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 the temporary approach allows you to make the gesture, the artistic gesture, and and get people's attention and interest and debate about something, but then the art disappears again and is left only in people's heads or minds or whatever, hearts. Um, and, and, and I think that kind of strategy can be more interesting and more important than an object which remains. <clears throat> I, used, I used to say to um, the people in Liverpool, because the, the investors in Liverpool, as it were, were saying, oh, but it's, why should I give all this money when it's only for 10 weeks or whatever, uh, if it's temporary? But I would say um, you get much more value for money from temporary, because <laughs> that's what they understood. You get much more value for money from what is temporary than what is long term, because if you put something out in the public space, people always complain, make a big outcry, there's huge publicity. And then they get used to it over 10 weeks. And then when you take it away again at the end of 10 weeks, they make a huge outcry and they say they want it to stay. So you get two outcries for the price of one. As if something's permanent, people only outcry at the beginning, and then, then that's it. So it's twice the value. <laughs> but sorry, that's a rather flippant answer to your question about councils. I don't know, I mean, um, you know, artists need champions. They need people who believe in them. They need people, they need people with power and money who believe in them. And, uh, uh, and um, so, it's up to all of us to try to make sure that the people with power and money make friends with artists and understand how important the vision is. Always contemporary, yes. <laughs> but um, no, I think the presumption should be that um, that it's temporary until proven that it should be permanent. I mean, there needs to be a decision that something is permanent at some point. Um, and some things will be very obviously. I mean, if you like in the designing happiness area, if we are, if we, if we are making a really positive improvement to a public space in terms of the comfort or the accessibility or whatever, then, then nobody, it won't occur to anybody that it should stop. Of course it will continue. Um, but if, if we are making something else which is more about creating debate, then debate gets tired and maybe the job can be done sometimes. And so, and then the artwork can disappear as long as the memory remains. So I think it's different, different contexts ask for different approaches. Exhaustion. Exhaustion. <laughs> okay. Uh, any last comments? Any last questions? Anyone? Okay. Um.
at this point, I think I will thank Lewis so, so much for uh, sharing uh, your practice uh, with us. And I'm sure we'll, we'll see you more in Comas uh, in the next, um, all the way to 2022. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm here to remind again uh, that uh, this, uh, this talk is part of Temple Academy, uh, which is an. Uh, wait, I'm just going to be a little bit. Sorry, I'm just going to say that.